today on Family Talk. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. James Dobson and this is Family Talk, a division of the new James Dobson Family Institute. Uh, Today is Giving Tuesday. Hope you know what that means. I want to uh, thank you for your continued support. Um, With the growth of the Dobson Family Institute, we really do need your help financially all the more. And right now, through the end of 2018, every gift you give will be doubled thanks to a wonderful matching grant from a dear friend of our ministry. Uh, You can learn more about our end-of-the-year match at drjamesdobson.org. That's the commercial. Today, we're going to continue with a classic conversation that I was part of that deals directly with a struggle that many parents are dealing with. Many years ago, Shirley and I were at a luncheon where we met three incredible mothers. Uh, We got to talking about their children, and many of them were undeniably strong-willed. I was moved by what they shared, and I felt it would be a good idea to invite them into the studio to talk about their parenting experience. Joining me back then on that day was Joy Solomon, a dedicated mom who was very active in her church's children's department. Next was Deborah Merritt, a retired teacher and mother of four. And lastly was Kristen Walker, a high school teacher and also a mother of four kids. Kristen's daughter, Liz, was with her mom at that time, and she was in the recording with us. So you're going to hear from her in the midst of this discussion. So let's pick up where we left off yesterday. It was an exciting and informative discussion. We're going to jump right in with where we were last time. What do you say to those who claim that children are born as a blank slate, that they're all the same at birth, and then the environment comes along and stamps in different temperaments? You have many children. Let's see, how many do we have? We've got 10 kids represented among the three of you. Every one of them is unique. Every one of them is different, right? Yes. Everyone. They, they no. are born with a personality. I truly believe that. And there is a continuum from one extreme to the other regarding this issue of the will, all the way from sweetness and light. I mean, they just love to please. And that's really part of their nature is to get that sense of satisfaction of pleasing you all the way over to the other side where the greatest thrill is to uh, precipitate a fight, right? That's right. I believe firmly that a strong-willed child loves conflict. They just love the battle. And I don't love the battle. It was a very difficult experience for me because I'm not strong-willed. I did uh, a research project many years ago on this subject. And uh, many of the things that we're talking about here were represented uh, in that study. But one of the things that, uh, that jumped out at me is where you have a compliant, loving mother who would not have dreamed taking on her parents in this way. And then you've got this kid that just gets the greatest fun out of fighting, as you said. you got tears in your eyes. I do have tears in my eyes. Let me tell you a story that's funny. Um, We did this thing, and I don't know whether it came from a Dobson book or whatever, where we would count to three. We would give the children, this is what we would like you to do. You have to the count of three to do it. And then we had this little wooden spoon that we would, you know, kind of swat them on there, which was hard for me. I'm not a spanker, so it was real hard for me to do that. Um, This was a situation where I'd taken Elizabeth and I'd put her in her her, um, high chair, and she was going to be eating. I was giving her Cheerios and fun things to eat, and I was working doing a fundraiser for some organization, and I was just trying to keep her busy. Well, at some point during the time, she says, Mother, I want to eat now. One, two, three, and me. I, <laughs> She's counting you down. By, by two and a half, I had her dinner ready for her. And my husband walked in the door, and he's, and I said, John, it works. I said, by, by two and a half, I had done everything that she wanted me to do. And he said, yeah, that's what we need is a, is a compliant mother and a strong-willed child. And that's Joy, you saw the tears a minute ago. Yes. Did you ever cry over this uh, issue when your daughter was young? I cried a lot when she was young. I cried a lot more during the teenage years. Yeah. Those were our dark, dark days. Mm. But especially as a young child, because I am um, 
the second born of a set of identical twins, and my twin sister is the dominant twin Mm. our entire life. So I tell people that when we were growing up, she would say, run. I said, how fast? She said, jump. I said, how high? And I assumed that my children would have more of my personality. And people that know me now, because I am more outgoing and very gregarious, they say, oh, Dana is just like you. And she isn't. I was so shy as a child. And to please my parents was my greatest role in life, to make them proud of me and and to please them. Um, I remember we went to a party once Davy and I were married, and it ended up where things that should not have been exposed to me, even at that age, was brought out, and I panicked. And we got out, and I said, they could have arrested me and called my parents. And Davy said, we're married. They're not calling your parents. And I said, but they would. So even at that age, to please my parents. And then to have this child that the defiant spirit was her goal in life, but a tremendous heart, like you said. Yeah. She had such a heart for the underdog and such a love. And what you say to them, they can turn back on you in a heartbeat. Because we had we had a phrase in the house that I refuse to negotiate with a four-year-old. I would say that to her constantly. She would say, well, if you don't do this, and I'd go, I refuse to negotiate with a four-year-old. This is the final answer. And one day at preschool, there was a young boy that they were mainstreaming who was handicapped. And Dana immediately befriended this child. More than anyone else in the class, she was drawn to that child. And this other one was, uh, another boy was making fun of, of this child. And she said, I'm only going to warn you once. Don't make fun of him again, or I'm going to have to beat you up. <laughs> well,. <laughs> He came back and made fun of him again, and Dana said, this was your last warning. I only give two warnings. Don't make fun of him again. Well, he came back, and before she was through with him, she had drunk him up one side of the playground and down the other. She had torn his shirt. She had torn his shorts with him screaming for Dana to let him go. And the teachers finally got a hold of her and said, Dana, did you not hear him asking you to let him go? And she said, I gave him two warnings. I refused to negotiate with a four-year-old. Hmm. Yeah. came right back to me. <laughs> so you see, the same will that's expressed with a parent is often expressed with peers, which can be an advantage because these youngsters are tough enough to do what they want to do whether there's peer pressure or not. Uh, Liz, uh, you're listening to all this. Tell me what's going through your mind. This is actually really fun for me, just hearing um, other stories about kids who have um, had to deal with this. And it's really interesting to hear what parents have to say about kids like me. And um, I've never thought about what parents have had to go through. Uh, This this gets really personal, but that's why we're all here. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see your mom cry? In a moment of conflict like that? Hardly ever. She's very... She's um, not a crier. She's very stoic, no. I think, is, is the word I... She's very solid. Yeah. I think she does that for me because... Did you ever know you were hurting her or upsetting her badly? I think deep down I did, but because she never showed that to me in any way, and because she was, you know, I'm going to win, I was like, well, pff, fine. You know, and so, so I did. So let's go at it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, Kristen, you're not a crier. Not a whole lot. You know not most any time. Can you understand why the two ladies here oh, felt yes. that way? Oh, yes. Did you feel that way? You just didn't express it the same oh, way. I was going to say I didn't express it in, in tears necessarily. I probably, we, we talked about this earlier, we think that even though none of us were strong-willed before we had strong-willed children, we have become strong-willed in order um, to cope with it. In order to cope with that, and I think um, I, I'm I'm pretty. I've always wanted to please people. I still do, uh, but I was bound and determined that my children were not going to defeat me in anything, and that that came really true with Liz. And yeah. and we fought those battles. And but I felt like there were days and weeks and periods that that's all I did. My entire days were consumed with disciplining her and trying to get her to follow the rules the way we had laid them out. And the other children were not behaving quite that way. Oh, no. No, not at all. Um, you'd tell my oldest and my youngest not to do something, and they'd look up with you there with their big blue eyes, and they'd say, 
oh, mommy, I'm sorry. And they'd never do it again. <laughs> Liz would say, let's go. <laughs> this is something that, that it's in the, in the genetic makeup uh, of the child. You're not giving Dana great hope. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Liz has the mother's curse. You know, I hope you have a child just like you. Wait I, I, till I've you taken get it further. Your I said, own, I hope right? all of yours are just like you. Oh. <laughs> I have told Dana that I hope neither uh, that she never experiences it because that would give me the strong-willed grandchild. It would. So that. I'm looking at easier <laughs> grandchildren. Yeah, it is uh, interesting again that some parents have four or five of them, all strong-willed. You guys each had essentially one that was really tough, right? Uh, well, I. I think that I have several that are strong-willed. Plus, I have one that trained another one to be a strong-willed. Yeah. Explain how she, she allowed her brother to she get She was out of strong it. enough to jump out of bed, and then she would collect whatever was in the room and put it in his crib. So she, he would step up on stuffed animals or whatever it was to jump out of bed. And then the two of them would be running loose all over the house. I mean, literally, this, this sounds ridiculous, but we would find them in the kitchen, in the sink, playing with knives, opening the refrigerator, throwing things around. I got to the point where the only way I could survive and know that they could survive, because literally, obedience was not my goal when they were, when they were two. Keeping them, Survival, alive. keeping them alive was all I yeah. could do. I slept outside their door with a pillow and a blanket you, yeah. because they would have to cross over me before they would leave the room. Mm. That's the and only that's way how, you could protect it's them. It's the only way I could protect them. And I prayed for them. You know, Joy, I prayed. We laid hands on them. We said, oh, Lord, spanking didn't work. I slept outside their door and prayed for them so they didn't kill themselves when they were little. And that sounds extreme. Deborah, have you, have you found yourself in moments like that with your face in your hands saying, <laughs> I am a total <laughs> failure as a mom. I did, because I wish I could say that I was like these ladies and just toe the line. I had four children. I had twins, yeah. and I was tired. You just couldn't fight all the and time. And I couldn't fight it. And what yeah. I did when they were a little bit older, and they, the Lord is good. I trust the power of prayer. I trust salvation. Yeah. When my kids became saved and they were baptized by their own choice, they all changed. They all uh -huh. became new people in Christ, and wonderful? their their personalities changed. And that happened at about 14 or 15 for each one of them. And truly, the Lord has done an incredible work that I can't uh -huh. take any responsibility for. I wish I'd been stricter. I wish I'd been firmer. But I did what I could do, and the Lord put me with four children, three of whom were very difficult at times. See, Deborah, every one of us is inadequate as a parent. Mm -hmm. We all have to depend on the Lord. And it, it hit me as a PhD in child development when my daughter was three that she would eventually make her own choices in life. And I could not uh, absolutely guarantee where she was going because I saw that there was something inside that I would not, eventually at least, would not control. And we come to the point where even in our greatest strengths, we have to say, Lord, you got to help me here. That's what parenting's all about. Joy, mm -hmm. did you depend on the Lord that way? Oh, boy, did uh -huh. I ever. I, I remember there were days when our, our phrase, when David got home at the end of the day, he wouldn't say, how was your day? He would say, how many spankings did she get today? And he wouldn't even ask about our son because he knew. So it was a battle all day long. All day long, from the time she woke up until the time she went to bed. And there are times that you would sit and she would be such an angel. She would be so caring and loving, and you'd go, okay, okay, we're making progress, we're making progress. And then 30 seconds later, one thing would trigger that strong will, and she would be off and running. And there were times, especially for stay-at-home moms, you feel like you are such a failure. You feel like, this is a career I chose. It's like if I had started a small business and just watched, invested all my money and watched it go under. Here I am looking at this child that God has entrusted to me, and I can't even control her. That, that was thoughts, our biggest thing. Yeah. We're finding consequences big enough to deter her will. And, um, I mean, we had to go to the elders of our church at one point <laughs> because <laughs> this now yeah, I, I, this is an embarrassing it. moment. It's about time she gets back. No. <laughs> um, she would steal. She would take whatever she wanted. And we'd say, Liz, why are you taking that? And she'd say, because I want it. 
and which was amazing to me that a four or a five year old could articulate the bottom line. I mean, because that was the bottom line. I wanted it. I took it. She'd steal money from the church or from the offering plate to buy a Coke from the Coke machine, or um, she stole some of the decorations out of the bathroom, just a little cinnamon stick, but she wanted it, therefore she took it. And it got to the point where we told her, you know, this is bad enough. We've spanked all we could do. We had to take her back and to Scripture, and my husband sat down with her and said, this is what Scripture says. You know, you've got to obey the authorities, and if you don't, we've got to go to a higher authority. And he uh, went to the elders of our church and asked a couple of them that had children if they would be willing to sit down with Liz. And at that time, she was probably in kindergarten, maybe first grade. And uh, these two godly men sat down with her and made her accountable, made her memorize Scripture. But it got to the point where she needed to know that there were higher we, we yeah. couldn't do it. And so we went with to the elders. And Liz, that had an impact on you, didn't it? Extremely, yes. What yes. do you remember about that? Just being embarrassed? I remember just being thoroughly embarrassed and, and having to be responsible for what I did to someone else yeah. and having to fess up to that responsibility. And um, I remember just until probably second grade, I would I, mean, I would take things from my teachers I would get into their desk if they had food in there, I would take their food and I stole um, my kindergarten teacher's earrings or something. And um, eventually my parents, you know, I was thinking, who cares? I can get my parents, I'll be disciplined, who cares? And the discipline didn't bother me. It was when they said, okay, you have to go to your teacher, you have to go to the elders and you have to apologize for doing that. And that's when I was like, oh no. And it was embarrassing and humbling and I realized what I had done. uh, (coughs) Discipline was not something that deterred you in any way. Didn't me, not a bit. You just figured out a way to get around it. Uh Well, it was more like, especially in middle school, it was like, well, I'll get disciplined so that I can try to break that discipline. You know, it was a challenge for you. Yeah. If I got grounded from the phone, I'd try to get on the phone. If I got See, grounded from the computer, I'd try to get on the computer. So it was got, just something else to be defined about. You have to figure out mm-hmm. where the kid is. you got to get behind <laughs> the eyes of the child. How many times have you heard me say that? Right. Get behind the eyes of the child, right. see it the way the child sees it, and then you know how to respond. Until you do that, you don't understand that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liz, my my mother knew that I was messing around at school. You know, I was just a discipline problem at school. And I was in the ninth grade, and people have heard this story before, but my mother figured out how to get to me, and she <laughs> told me, you behave any way you want to at school, and I'm not going to do anything about it unless they call me. But if they ever call me, I'm going to school with you, and I'm sitting beside you, and you'll be standing in the hall with your friends. I'm going to be right there, and you will not be able to shake me for a whole day. Man, that shaped me up huh. in a big hurry. <laughs> How'd you go about it? <laughs> um, I, I went to school. That's what I did. I, I've been a teacher for 10 years. I went to school with my children. And I think part of the reason I did is so that I could watch them and I could be part of their lives in a huge, huge way. Um, my child got even with me for doing that. This is this is kind of an interesting story because I can't believe that you know they would do this kind of thing. But Christina, I was so guilty, felt so guilty about going to school and going back to work because I was a real firm believer in the at-home mom. But I thought, really, I'm at school with them all day long. Um, it's kind of like having mom at, at all the time. She told all of the parents that were very, very much at-home mothers that because her mother worked, she wasn't a good mom and she she didn't have the time to make her lunches for her. So somehow she manipulated getting a hot lunch every day out of every nice woman in the entire school and I had everybody watching me walk up and down the hall like what right do you have to be here and I thought wait a minute and finally the teacher called me in and said we have a little problem you know Christina never has lunch and so everybody feels sorry for her and they give her these lunches and I I looked at her and I, I looked at the teacher and I said I will handle this and I went to this child and I said honey I pack six lunches every night at 10.30 I said where is your lunch she says mommy she says I learned that if I told them I didn't have a lunch, somebody would provide me with a really nice hot lunch, and I didn't have to eat peanut butter and jelly anymore. Mm. Um, she got even with me for going to school. <laughs> mm. it, that matter of vulnerability on the part of the parent uh, becomes a very powerful weapon in the hands of the child. It's like a, it's like a military situation. You probe the line for weaknesses, and if the parent recoils in pain, when the child says, I hate you, or go tells the neighbors you're abusing them, or who knows what, 
uh, Deborah, like mm-hmm. uh, what you experienced, then they've they've won the ultimate victory. You know, it is just uh, the way it is in some situations, and you just have to put an arm around those parents. If you know somebody going through this, don't mm-hmm. you dare accuse them of being a bad parent. Pray mm-hmm. for them and uh, offer some advice and maybe buy a book for them. Or <laughs> All right, folks, at least acknowledge, those of you in the listening audience, at least acknowledge that in this atmosphere that we live in today, where there are abused Mm -hmm. children out there, Mm -hmm. the most terrifying thing that can be said about a good parent Mm -hmm. is that they have abused their children. And uh, and some kids are smart enough to figure that out and to manipulate that. Mm -hmm. And to discipline Liz a couple of times, um, the military is very careful about that. And um, as every parent knows, the commissary or the grocery store is the place for a child to, to stretch sure. your, check your limits. And, and I had to take her out of the commissary to discipline her once, to spank her. And uh, boy, the looks I got were just like accusing me. Uh, and I knew if I'd spanked her there, I would have been accused. Yeah. Um, but um, so, yeah, it, it, you have to be very And careful. the world's changed even since yes. then. There are some yes. people that feel any physical punishment is child abuse. Mm-hmm. It's not, but that's the way the Our culture is to, going. She would, if she was in trouble in the car and she knew what was ahead of her, she would put both hands on the window and she would scream at people as they drove by, especially at red lights, save me, <laughs> save me. You are kidding. No, Joy. no, we're, we're not kidding about it. <laughs> I'm thinking if a police pulls up, they're, they're pulling me over. Right. I'm going to have to show them that this really is my child. Save me. Well, it's quite a funny story to end today's broadcast here on Family Talk. But despite the humor that these women shared, of course, there are some moments of real anguish as well. Parenting isn't easy. It does take a lot of work and dedication. And if you need help as a mom or a dad, be sure to request Dr. Dobson's book, The Strong-Willed Child. It's a helpful guide to correctly and sternly parenting these kids. Remember through all this that their behavior does not reflect what you have done as a parent. Some kids are just wired to be more combative and challenging of your authority. Don't get discouraged. There is hope. Visit today's broadcast page to get your hands on a copy of the book, The Strong-Willed Child. As we close, I want to quickly remind you of our Station Finder feature at drjamesdobson.org. Under the broadcast menu, there's a Family Talk Radio Stations button. Once you click it, you'll see our interactive map of all of our radio affiliates. Simply tap on the state or country where you live to see when we are playing near you. Take advantage of our Station Finder feature at drjamesdobson.org. This is Roger Marsh. I want to thank you for your consistent prayer and financial support of this ministry. And thanks for listening today as well. Join us again next time as we conclude Dr. Dobson's discussion on Parenting the Strong-Willed Child. Don't miss that broadcast tomorrow right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Have you noticed that children will occasionally disobey their parents for the express purpose of testing just how much they can get away with? This game called Challenge the Chief can be played with surprising skill even by very young children. For Family Talk, here's Dr. James Dobson. One father told me recently of taking his three-year-old daughter to a basketball game. Naturally, the child was interested in everything in the gymnasium except the game, so the father permitted her to roam free. But he did walk her down to the stripe painted on the gym floor, and he told her not to go past that line. No sooner had he returned to his seat when she scurried down the aisle and straight toward the forbidden territory. She stopped at the border, then flashed a grin over her shoulder at her father as she deliberately placed one foot over the line. It was as if she were saying, what you gonna do about it? Virtually every parent the world over has been asked that same question at one time or another. 
Now, when a parent ignores this kind of challenge, something changes in the parent-child relationship. For a particularly strong-willed boy or girl, that early test of parental leadership can grow into a full-blown case of rebellion during the troubled days of adolescence. The ultimate paradox of childhood is that boys and girls want to be led by their parents, but insist that their mothers and fathers earn the right to lead them. Hear more at drjamesdobson.org. Dr. Tim Clinton here for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. You like listening on the go, maybe while you're working out or jogging down the street? We've got a special offer for you right now today. Download free the smartphone mobile app for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. It works with iPhones, iPads, Android devices, and best of all, you can get this program delivered to you every day, 24-7, 365. It's a great way to stay connected to Family Talk. And not only our broadcast, but you can join the conversation and our Family Talk Facebook page, read blogs, watch videos on topics of faith, family, culture, and more. By the way, search for books and digital media in our resource center and a whole lot more. You can't be free. Go to drjamesdobson.org. Download it today, drjamesdobson.org. 